Then we're in physical chemistry, chapter 17, section 11. First, we're going to talk about unimolecular reactions. Now, remember, most reactions are bimolecular, but there are unimolecular reactions. One example would be isomerization. Another would, might be decomposition. Those can both be unimolecular. Here's an example of isomerization. So here we have CH2, 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 the cyclopropane. It can go to CH3, CH, CH2. Notice the double bond. This is propene. So the energy of activation for this is not zero. It's 274 kilojoules per mole. So R is going to be equal to constant times the concentration of this uh, symbol here, the cyclopropane, because we're just showing the carbon atoms in a circle. Here's another example of an isomerization. C is through NC. So this is methyl isocyanide going to CH3CN, methyl cyanide. And again, the energy of activation for this is not zero. It's 160.5 kilojoules per mole. An example of decomposition, so we have CH2H3Cl, so it is that chloroethane, and then going to CH, C2H4, so I think that's ethene, and then HCl, hydrochloric acid or hydrogen chloride. So again, the energy of activation is not zero, it's 360 kilojoules per mole. And then we have HNO3 going to NO2 and then OH. So this NO2, this substance is brown, and this OH here, remember this free electron, um, odd number electron, this is called a free radical. So now let's talk about the Lindemann mechanism. So let's say we go A to B in isomerization. So we have A going to B, or also C, etc., etc. They can be a unimolecular reaction in the gas phase. And then we're going to say M is just any third body. So M could be any other molecule. It can be an inert gas, it could be product, reactant, it doesn't matter as long as it can store energy, basically. So here we go. So A plus M, so we're starting out with our reactant and then some other third body. And then there's a reaction uh, constant, you know, rate constant, going to A star plus M. So A star is basically, it's the same reactant, but in a higher energy state. It's picked up energy from M. So that was one elementary physical reaction. Not really a chemical reaction, just transferring energy. And then we're going from M to A star, and then here's the reverse reaction, back to M and A. So this is back to where we started. That means there's no actual chemical reaction going on. Just A picked up energy, and then A lost that same energy again. But the third possibility would be so that A star, there's a forward rate constant K2, becoming a product B plus maybe C, etc. So this would be, B would be the isomer of A or whatever. Or B plus C would be if you have a decomposition. So overall we get A star going to K2 to B plus C if it's a, you know, decomposition or isomerization. So then R is equal, the rate of the reaction is going to be the derivative of the concentration of B with respect to time, and that's going to be equal to the forward rate constant K2 times the concentration of A star, which is the energized state of A, higher energy state of A. We'll call that equation one. So what we're going to do is we're going to treat this um, higher energy state of substance A, the reactant, as an intermediate, since it's going to have a short lifetime anyway. Higher energy means this can be less stable, right? So apply the steady state approximation by setting the derivative of the concentration of this energized state substance, A, with respect to time, equal to zero. So we have the derivative of A star, the concentration of A star, with respect to time. It's going to be equal to K1 times the concentration of A times the concentration of M minus K minus 1 times the concentration of M times the concentration of A star minus K2 times the concentration of A star, and that's going to be equal to zero. Now we need to solve for the concentration of A star. So we get A star is equal to K1 times the concentration of A times the concentration of M divided by K minus 1 times the concentration of M plus K2. Now we're going to substitute that into equation 1. So we get R is equal to K2 
times k1 times the concentration of a times the concentration of m divided by k minus 1 times the concentration of m plus k2. Now all these terms on the right except for the concentration of a are constant. Now we have k for the unimolecular reaction, UNI stands for unimolecular. We have k2 times k1 times the concentration of m divided by k1 times the concentration of m plus k2. Now there are two limiting cases. One, if k1 or k minus 1 times the concentration of m is much greater than k2, then we get r is equal to k2, k1 times k2 times the concentration of a divided by k minus 1. That means the concentration of m's will just cancel out. So we get r is equal to ka, which is going to be first order reaction. k is equal to k1, k2 over k minus 1. This is what's going to happen in this example under high pressure. Now the second case, what if K2 is much greater than K1 to the nth concentration of the M? Then we get R is equal to K1, K2, concentration of M, concentration of A divided by K2. The K2s will cancel out, so then we have R is equal to K1 times the concentration of M times the concentration of A, and that's second order. So this is what's going to happen at low pressure. So what happens, whether this reaction seems to be first order or second order, it depends basically on how long does the intermediate A star last. So if the lifetime of this higher energy state of A is short, then K2 approaches infinity. So we get A plus M going to B plus C, and that's second order. But if A is zero, A star, it has a non-zero or a, you know, appreciable lifetime, then A star going to B plus C is first order. Now let's say um, we have I2, that's got one stretching mode. C2, or CH3 to CH3 has three N to minus five vibration modes, vibrational modes. Now the experimental rate law. R is equal to K2, K1, times the concentration of M, times the concentration of A, divided by K minus 1, times the concentration of M, plus K2. And that's going to be equal to K unimolecular, times the concentration of A. So we have K unimolecular is equal to K1, K2, times the concentration of M, divided by K minus 1, times the concentration of M, plus K2. And that's going to be equal to K1, K2, divided by k minus 1 plus k2 over concentration of m. So that'll be our experimental rate constant, the k unimolecular here. Now remember, concentration of m is the total concentration or pressure of all the species. In the book, they call it the third body. But remember, that's, you know, everything. Products, reactants, whatever is in the system. So the limit, as the pressure approaches infinity, the K unimolecular is equal to K1, K2 over K minus 1, since K2 over concentration of M approaches 0 at high pressure. Now the limit as pressure goes to 0, K unimolecular is equal to K1 times K2 over K2 concentration of M. The K's hues cancel out, so you end up with K1 times the concentration of M at low pressure. So at high pressure, the rate observed is equal to K unimolecular times the concentration of A is equal to K1, K2 over K minus 1 times the concentration of A, and that's just equal to K times the concentration of A. And that's if you're first order. Now at low pressure, the rate observed is equal to K unimolecular, or yeah, times the concentration of A, or is equal to K1 times the concentration of M times the concentration of A, and that's second order. So here's a graph of how it might look versus pressure. So this is the K for unimolecular. So down here at lower pressure, it'll seem second order. And then higher pressure, it'll seem first order. So down here, the you know observed K is going to be equal to K1 times the concentration of M. But up here, the observed K will just be K1 times K2 over K minus 1.